psychology and the, the history of the discipline and why, you know, as social and critical psychologists, we choose to use particular methodologies. And so I always start, uh, use as the starting point psychology's role in legitimizing colonialism and, and apartheid through certain research projects. Uh, often referred to as scientific racism. And so I, I think it's our, it's our duty as a psychologist now to kind of in, start interrogating the, the types of practices that might perpetuate um, ideas around race, class, and gender differences. Right? So often we, we find that the work of psychologists tends to reproduce ideas about black people being violent, women being irrational, the poor being deviant, etc., etc. So, certain populations which have always been marginalized by psychological research, and I like this phrase that Anne Felix uses, which is, you know, um, an absence from research or a pathologized presence. <coughs> and so, this type of knowledge kind of can you know, re-inscribe processes of inferiorization and control because when we, when we create, when we produce knowledge, right, psychological knowledge, when it becomes part of popular uh, discourse, um, it can reproduce certain stereotypes. So scientific knowledge translates into some kind of common sense. And, and given that psychology is very much concerned with attitudes and behavior, um, it's going to take a lot of, well, as I've discovered, <laughs> work to kind of change those attitudes that we've learned and partly learned because of our own work. So how do we use psychology to, to, for transformation and social change? And one way of thinking about it is how do we bridge the gap between theory and methodology? Because often when we, when we separate those two things, it's as if we're saying that there's knowledge out there waiting to be discovered. When in fact, when we're doing research, we're actually producing knowledge. We're the ones who are producing knowledge in the, in the process of research. There's not this idea of there's something out there that's waiting to be discovered. And so I, I tend to use participatory action research. There's different methods. Um, and I've, I've you know, over the past 10 years, used something called photovoltaics. And what the advantages of, of participatory action research is that Whoever you're working with, whatever population group you're going to do research with, um, the idea is that they are participating in the process. And so as a researcher, you become more like a facilitator. Um, and you are, you are collecting um, stories, experiences of the people who you're working with. The, the other thing, well, the, I suppose the, I should have started with this, and one of the most important things about participatory action research is that it's got an explicit agenda of social change and social justice. And there's an acknowledgement, so bridging that gap between theory and, and method, there's an acknowledgement in PAR that knowledge is produced through the daily experiences of the people participating in the research. <coughs> So photo voice is one of those uh, participatory action research methods. Um, it was first, it, the term was coined, now I can't remember the date, but I think it was late 1980s, Caroline Wang and uh, somebody Boris, who did work with women in China, and um, they, they were the first to coin this term photo voice. And it refers to a methodology where you researchers work with particular marginalized communities 
and collect stories through or collect information about their daily lives through uh, stories, the written text and photography. And what happens is that the, the, the participants themselves, the ones who are using cameras, taking pictures, and telling stories about their lives. I usually, when I do photo voice work, ask a group of people to talk about what are your the assets in your community and what are the challenges. So photo voice and photo voice theory is a participatory approach, meaning that um, unlike other methods that also use photography, like photo dissertation or photo novella, it's a it's a participatory process in the sense that people will come together and talk about their photographs and engage with each other on the issues they raise. And the reason behind that is. Is, a, is a, a process, is getting people to, under, to, to start a process of critical consciousness. So understanding these are the assets in my community, these are the, ch the challenges in my community, and why, why, where do those challenges come from? Why do they exist? And we want to go beyond, you know, simplistic explanations that have to do with People are lazy, they don't want to work, etc., etc. So we want to go beyond that and then try and understand what are the structural conditions that make people's lives the way they are. <coughs> and then slowly people will come to think about what is it that I can do to change my circumstances or the circumstances of my community. <coughs> so that's part of the process of critical consciousness and getting people involved social change, recognizing themselves as agents of social change. So the photo voice theory is originally conceptualized as critical consciousness drawing on Paolo Freire's work, feminist theory, so the idea that, um, the idea of standpoint, the idea that people's experiences must be told by them, right, because they're most they're the experts in their own lives. We are not the experts in their lives. And thirdly, documentary photography. So documentary photography is concerned about um, telling stories that are current. <coughs> and also through, through photographs which, which give another kind of affective dimension to a story that we can't necessarily tell just with words. Um, so the, the elements of the Photo Voice project is <coughs> briefly, I mean, there's so many ways to do Photo Voice work. Um, and in the projects I've run, it depends very much on the setting, the group, the resources available, um, what actually happens in the project. But at every phase, we try and work with the participants to kind of direct the process. <coughs> so we have an initial focus group or planning session and we'll talk about what people want out of this process um, and maybe talk about a particular theme. So yesterday I was presenting my talk I was presenting on uh, the photo voice work I've done with black students at UCT. So in the first focus group we would talk about well, what does transformation mean to you? What does decolonization mean to you? And then we'll, you know, um, bring up themes will come up, and then based on those, uh, we go into a second session, which is not, at, you know, necessarily on the same day or anything, where we have a, a photography training session. Uh, I usually invite a professional to um, do the training. We will talk about composition, lighting. Uh, framing, how to make a nice photograph. Because I think I found that when participants <coughs> can take better photos, they are happier <laughs> with the process. <coughs> and after that session, we also talk about what is the value <coughs> of photography, what can photographs do, we talk about theory around representation, how to represent something or something. And I come, I bring back the themes that they raised 
in the first group and we talk about it. So if it's about curriculum change, for instance, then we'll, we'll talk about what does that mean? How do we do curriculum change? And how are you going to tell that story in a photograph? How are you going to represent decolonizing your curriculum in a photograph? And so that when, by the time participants leave that session, they have a clear idea of what they're going to do with their cameras. Um, <coughs> and then a few, give them maybe a few weeks, depending who the group is, and we'll come back together and they'll present their photo stories to each other. And that will also generate more conversation. So participants will come back and um, one of the things that generated a lot of conversation in that particular project at UCT was um, trans, trans issues. So I had a few students who were transgender and they came back with their ex stories about their experiences in uh, student residences, and I think that was very uh, eye-opening for a lot of the other students <coughs> who were there who have never encountered that before. So <coughs> it's, a, it's about raising awareness, a critical consciousness amongst uh, the <coughs> participants, building solidarity, um, but also, yeah, raising awareness in others. And then that process can actually be cyclical. So students might, or participants might decide to go back and take more photos or develop their stories in a particular way based on the outcomes of the, the discussion. And then the final phase of the project is the public exhibition. So when participants produce their photographs and their written stories, we print them and have a public exhibition. And the idea with that is to continue the process of raising awareness with members of the public, um, but also to target specific people who can have an, some kind of impact on the lives of the participants. <coughs> so in a university setting, we invited people in senior management who students do not, nec do not necessarily have access to. When I've done work in in um, rural areas or semi-urban areas, um, we've invited people from lo local government, for instance. There was uh, particular stories about housing or water shortages and so on. We invite people who we think can can um, have a you know some kind of input um, in terms of the process of change that needs to happen. Um, and maybe just to, to finish off, there's a, a, a photo voice model that's been developed, um, which was done by um, these two uh, academics involved in health promotion research. Uh, a lot of the photo voice work has been in the area of health. And uh, they've created this model which basically looks um, like this. <laughs> there's, a, there's the training and in the initial discussion groups, and then there's the um, critical discussions and research and document, documentation, which is that cyclical process of producing the stories and the photographs and uh, engaging <coughs> the engagement process. And then the outcomes, which they talk about in terms of the critical consciousness. So a heightened understanding of community uh, needs and assets. And then some sh something for social capital. So the development of ties in the community. So the, the creating solidarity amongst participants, but also amongst other people who might be Targeted, or who might be involved in the process. Mm -hmm. So, in some mm -hmm. examples, for instance, um, I'm trying to think of one. Uh, I had a, uh, a participant who wanted to do a story about what it is like to live in a shack, and so she went around her community, her neighbourhood, 
and spoke to people and asked them, what is it like to live in a shack? And in doing that, she kind of um, started making ties with people and talking about the project and why she's doing it. And, and so the, the participatory process goes beyond just the group that you're working with. And that's what about social capital. Also developing networks with um, you know, those powerful institutions like government and <coughs> management and so on is also about social capital. And then the third thing, third outcome of Photo Voice is what researchers refer to as empowerment. I know it's a term that's not very well defined, but empowerment in the sense of uh, becoming more conscious of self, becoming more conscious of your own ability to be an agent of change, um, and also being recognized. So often through the process, after particularly in the, in the exhibition phase, um, people, participants become, develop a sense of recognition for what they've done. Um, I, I remember a project in particular uh, where this was very significant was a project with sex workers in Cape Town. And they would, their exhibition um, in the end was a travel. They were invited to travel to different places across the country, by invited by different organizations to talk about, to present their photographs. And they felt that, um, they often said things like, I never knew that my story would be of any interest to anybody. So there's that sense of kind of empowerment and confidence and self-confidence. Um, yes, I think I, I'll leave it there. I do have examples if, if there's any interest, but I need to get my USB to work. <laughs> but I think, let me just leave it there. Thank you, Rob. Stage, I'll open to the floor. Any questions?